Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Adrian Malone for a talk on acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Dr. Adrian Malone is an assistant professor of medicine at the Zach Hospital of Medicine in Mount Sinai. She received her medical degree at SUNY Buffalo. Dr. Malone completed her internal medicine residency and hematology and oncology fellowship training at the Zach Hospital of Medicine in Mount Sinai. She joined the Mount Sinai faculty as an assistant professor with a clinical focus on hematologic malignancies and bone marrow transplantations. Dr. Malone's research interests focus on the application of Hematopoietic stem cell transplantation for treatment of leukemia with an aim to improve safety, tolerability, and patient outcomes. She has also developed a strong interest in student, resident, and fellow medical education and serves as the director of the Hematology, Medical Oncology, and Bone Marrow Transplant Fellowships at Mount Sinai. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adrian Malone. Uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you very kindly for the invitation, and today we'll be focusing on ALL, and maybe I should have renamed the title in, um, in light of the Star Wars release of um, the force of immunotherapy in ALL Awakens. Um, <laughs> the movie is great, so, okay. Um, I have no disclosures. And so I thought today I would start with a quote, and I think for many of the residents um, in the room, this really rings true to my experiences as a trainee, um, a medical student, a resident, and a fellow in oncology, how we feel about that phone call when there's a new acute leukemic in the emergency room or as a transfer that appears on the floor. Um, for an oncologist in training, to leukemia represents a special incarceration of cancer. Its pace, its acuity, its breathtaking, inexorable arc of growth forces rapid, often drastic decisions. It is terrifying to experience, terrifying to observe, and terrifying to treat. The body invaded by leukemia is pushed to its brittle physiological limit. Every system, heart, lung, blood, working at the knife edge of its performance. And this is from the emperor of all maladies. And I think this really, this really resonates deeply within me when I get that phone call. Um, and so leukemia was first identified um, by anatomists and pathologists dating back to the 1800s. Rudolf Virchow really gets the credit for first terming, coining the word leukemia, coming from the Greek for leukos, white, and hema, blood, coming together with leukemia. Franz Ernst Christian Newman then identified through evaluation of anatomy specimens that the bone marrow in patients with leukemia had a yellow-green color instead of the red of a normal bone marrow. Then the evolution of knowledge for leukemia further came about with, clone, with naming leukemia as a family of diseases, initially in 1900, and then as subclassifications with CLL, CML, ALL, and erythroleukemia. The dawn of chemotherapy for ALL really first originated from Sidney Farber in Boston in 1947, first utilizing aminopterin, which is a folic acid mimic which showed improvement but not cure in ALL. Then the then combination chemotherapy started to be developed by Emile Freyrich, Emile Frey, and then the establishment of the cancer and leukemia group B which was a collaborative group working through multiple clinical trials to establish combination chemotherapy, which has now led to cure more than 80% of children with ALL. And the CLGB was led by none other than Mount Sinai's Dr. James Holland for many years from 1963 to 1981. We may think leukemia is highly common here at Mount Sinai, but in fact, ALL accounts for only 0.4% of new cancer diagnoses per year. In the US, there are 6,250 new cases estimated to be diagnosed this year in both adults and children with 1,450 deaths. It is the most common malignancy in children, accounting for 80% of pediatric leukemia, and the numbers are flipped in adults, where in adults, 20% of acute leukemia is comprised by ALL, and the remainder majority is AML. There is an increased incidence with radiation exposure, toxic chemicals, Down syndrome, and more recently, obesity has also been linked to an increase in ALL. This graphic shows nicely the 
percentage of ALL diagnoses in children. So younger than 20, 57.6% of diagnoses are made in ALL. And then as we get older, the numbers are really distributed to where a very small percentage of ALL is diagnosed in the elderly. In terms of race and ethnicity, there is an increase in the Hispanic population relative to the you know, white population and other population groups. When patients present with leukemia, they present with symptoms of, pancyto of cytopenias that are related to the bone marrow compartment being overtaken by the leukemic clone. So we can see that patients can present with B symptoms, including weight loss, fever, night sweats, symptoms of thrombocytopenia with easy, ble easy bleeding and bruising, and um, you can have purpura and petechia. We can also see fatigue due to anemia, as well as hepatosplenomegaly and lymphadenopathy. To make a diagnosis, a bone marrow biopsy, a per review of the peripheral smear and a bone marrow biopsy needs to be done. And what we're looking for is really to see on ALL or in another acute leukemia, we see that the bone marrow is infiltrated with this very monomorphous population of cells. What we're losing is the heterogeneity of a normal bone marrow where we can see elements of all three cell lineages. But instead, we only see one monomorphic population. And up close, on higher magnification, you can see that the blast cells, this is on the in the peripheral blood, but the blast cells are very large. They're extremely immature with a very fine chromatin and you know, a very large nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. So you lose that maturation of a mature lymphocyte. And for ALL, these are the cells of origin that we are interested in. The FAB classification of ALL, the French American British classification, has currently now really ha is of historical significance. This was originally put into place in 1976 and described the leukemic cells based on their morphology. And as a result, the three different morphologies, L1, L2, and L3, they really don't have a great prognostic significance because they were purely based on the appearance of the leukemic cells. This went out of favor and is now really of historical interest alone. Currently, the WHO classification, which was released in 2008, is the current primary classification for ALL. And precursor lymphoid neoplasms are divided into B cell diseases as well as T cell diseases. B cell ALL is either classified as having one of seven recurrent cytogenetic abnormalities, or NOS. 80% of patients have one of the seven recurrent chromosomal abnormality. And of these, if you have, tri if you have translocation 1221, which is the TEL AML1 rearrangement, hyperdiploidy, or translocation 119, you, your disease is associated with a more favorable prognosis. Translocation 922, having BCR ABLE1 rearrangement, is Philadelphia positive ALL, which, has a, which is a very high risk disease. Other poor risk diseases have MLL rearrangements and hypodiploidy. T cell ALL is characterized by mutations in the T cell receptor genes. We identify the immunophenotype of ALL based on flow cytometry and or on immunohistochemistry. And 70% of all, of all um, acute lymphoblastic leukemias are B cell, 25% are T cell, and mature B cell accounts for 2 to 5%. The B cell malignancies express typical B cell markers. TDT is a marker of immaturity, and this is present in both B cell and T cell um, ALL. Other common other features to be aware of for B cell is the presence of CD19, and this will become very important in our discussion in the second half of this talk. Um, T cell leukemias are significant because they have, they have CD7, CD3, which are common 
T cell markers. Burkitt's is a different disease because it's not, it's not a precursor disease, but a mature, a mature B cell neoplasm. And it is significant because it has CD20 and surface immunoglobulin or kappa lambda light chain expression. And we see that it's mature because TDT is negative. And so we use this testing plus the cytogenetic testing to complete our diagnosis for the patient. And the cytogenetic features in ALL are different based on age. And this is probably in part due to having very different diseases in children and in adults. And so in adults, um, the most common, adults typically have poor risk cytogenetic features much more commonly than children. And so the good risk features, hyperdiploidy, translocation 1221 and 119 account for a very small percentage of adult ALL, where we see a much higher percentage in children. And this does account for the better outcomes that we see in children. Something that I wanted to, that has now come to light, is BCR-ABLE1-like ALL, which is a disease that has the gene expression profiling similar to Philadelphia-positive ALL, but does not have the bcr abel um, translocation that's identifiable on fish or on, um, or on standard cytogenetic analysis. And this is associated with a poor risk disease as well. <coughs> and so the approach to treatment needs to be very different. Children are able to achieve a complete response in 97 to 99% of children. And the five-year disease-free survival for children is 75 to 87 percent. The outcomes in adults are not so rosy, with a CR rate of only 75 to 90 percent and a five-year survival that's abysmal, 25 to 50 percent. So why is this? Why do adults have such inferior outcomes relative to children? Adults have a higher frequency of poor risk cytogenetic features. Their disease biology is different. They're older, they may have more comorbidities, and they also have a decreased ability to tolerate the same intensive multi-agent chemotherapy that children are able to tolerate with greater ease. There's also a difference in the treatment regimens that are used by adult oncologists for adults versus pediatric. So the literature that has really been recently published are looking at the outcomes of adolescents and young adults. When these adolescents and young adults, this age group is treated by pediatric oncologists using pediatric regimens that have a lot more l asparaginase and more intensive chemotherapy, they do better than when we treat these patients. We might be lax, we might let the, let the patient go to a family wedding. We might, we might not be as strict with the treatment as pediatric um, oncologists are, and we give less, and we may dose reduce faster than for the pediatric population. But that's really currently a very robust area of research, looking at the differences not only in treatment outcomes, but also in the disease biology of ALL in different age groups. And so what is the approach to treatment for ALL? ALL is a horrendously complex disease to treat. And, but the key concepts that um, I want to emphasize are that the initial period of treatment, the remission induction period, this is when the patient first presents. The white count is high, the hemoglobin and platelets are low, and the patient has overt disease. So this period accounts for about four to six weeks. And your goal for this period is to restore normal hematopoiesis and to eradicate the malignant clone. The core components of remission induction include combination chemotherapy, a corticosteroid, which may be prednisone or dexamethasone based on the regimen, the anthracycline being doxorubicin or donorubicin, again, based on the regimen, um, cyclophosphamide, l asparaginase and different regimens may incorporate cytarabine or rituxan. Once the patient is in remission, then you move forward to consolidation and intensification. And this typically spans is multiple modules of chemotherapy that span approximately six months. Once the patient has completed the induction and the consolidation phases and they remain in remission, they go on to long-term maintenance therapy for up to two years. <coughs> 
CNS prophylaxis is also a very important component of ALL therapy because the CNS is a sanctuary site for leukemic cells, and without CNS prophylaxis, the risk of relapse in patients can be upwards of 30 percent. The most common regimen that is used for ALL, I'll review two of the most common regimens, is the CLGB regimen. This regimen has gone through multiple, um, multiple incarnations with, very, with many studies as the years have gone on, but the concepts remain the same, that you cycle through three modules um, from induction, then you have these different periods of intensification, a dedicated module to CNS prophylaxis, receiving combination of chemotherapy, and then culminating in 24 months of maintenance therapy. For patients that have, are Philadelphia positive, these patients also receive tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib or dasatinib. The complete response rate is 85%, with the five-year overall survival 35%. So patients are responding to treatment, but patients don't remain in remission. The other common regimen that we use a lot here on HEMONC is hyper-CVAD. This is a regimen that was developed at MD Anderson Cancer Center. And if you look at the drugs side by side between hyper-CVAD and CLGB, they're not that different. Um, the differences are that for hyper-CVAD, with patients who are CD20 positive, you would incorporate rituximab. Um, and the intrathecal therapy is is more intense in hyper-CVAD, but the chemotherapy alternates between odd cycles and even cycles, where you alternate between hyperfractionated cyclophosphamide and high-dose methotrexate and ERAC. And this also culminates in long-term maintenance. The response rate is slightly higher in hyper-CVAD. These have not been compared head-to-head, -head, so um, in terms of the CLGB versus hyper-CVAD, but the five-year survival rate, again, is 39 percent. And so what is the optimal consolidation for these patients once you've gotten them into remission? As you see, the overall survival rate is 35 to 40 percent. So we need to really adapt a very a better risk stratified approach for these patients. And so not all patients should continue on chemotherapy, but some patients should be referred for transplantation. And who are those patients? So we need to assess for high-risk features. So older than 35, if it takes you longer than four weeks to achieve a complete remission, that's a high-risk feature. If you present with a high white count at diagnosis, again, a high-risk feature. Based on your cytogenetic molecular abnormalities, Philadelphia positive, um, hypodiploidy, et cetera, and minimal residual disease. This is something that I'm going to focus on a little bit because if there is more than one in 10,000 leukemic cells detected, there is a high risk for relapse disease and associated with a very poor outcome. So once you identify these high-risk <laughs> patients, how are you going to decide whether or not to proceed with an allogeneic transplant? Interestingly, transplantation for patients in first remission, this is after you induct, induce patients and they're in remission, Clinical trials have had conflicting results as to who would benefit from transplantation. Some trials have shown a benefit. Um, no benefit for high-risk patients was shown in the largest study, which is an international collaboration between U.S. and European sites. A Cochrane review, which was a systematic meta-analysis published in 2011, did show an overall survival in patients who had a donor. When you look at transplant studies, these are randomized studies, but they're not your typical randomized blinded studies because patients are assigned to the group based on their biologic randomization. So if you have a sibling donor, you are randomized to the donor group. And if you don't, then you're randomized to the other arm. So these are not your standard randomized control studies, but based on donor availability. So in these studies, patients who had a sibling donor, a perfectly matched sibling donor, did show a benefit in terms of transplantation and first remission. The MRC call study studied 1,913 patients, and this is a very large number for transplant studies. Over a 13-year period, 
and a fairly young population of patients. All patients received initial chemotherapy, and then if they were in remission and they had a sibling donor, they went on to transplantation. If they had no sibling donor, they received additional chemotherapy, or they were randomized to having an autologous transplant. Philadelphia positive patients, if they also could have a transplant if they had an unrelated donor or a sibling donor. And so the results were very, very interesting. Overall, patients that had a donor had a survival benefit, which was statistically significant. But for an allogeneic transplant, only patients with standard risk disease had a survival benefit. The high-risk patients did not have a survival benefit. And this was thought to be due to the high risk of treatment-related treatment mortality in early death post-transplant. So this was very interesting because this is a large study and didn't show a benefit to high-risk patients. But also remember that this study spans 13 years and at this point may be a bit outdated. So in terms of thinking about transplantation, this is a, this is a composite um, data from the Be the Match, which is nat the National Marrow Donor Program, which facilitates all of our unrelated donor transplantation. And you can see with each data point, long-term survival has improved, the last being 2010 to 2012. Now with the two-year survival reaching over 50%. And these are for patients who received unrelated donors for transplantation. And so to transplant or not to transplant? The results have been controversial, so how do you decide? Clearly we're missing something because if you look at how we currently classify standard risk and high risk patients, we're not classifying everybody correctly because 40 to 50% of standard risk patients will relapse. So are those people really standard risk or are they high risk patients? But a quarter of high risk patients treated with chemotherapy alone will not relapse, thinking that that population, everybody should probably relapse. So we need better prognostic markers. And as a result, the, the ideas about minimal residual disease and how important it is, how important MRD is in relapse, has really become very prominent. MRD is an estimate of chemosensitivity. And you can identify a very low number of leukemic cells, so as little as 1 in 10,000 cells. It can, it's a very strong predictor of impending hematologic relapse. And it shows that these patients may actually have intrinsic drug resistance to our combination chemotherapy. MRD can be assessed through sophisticated flow cytometry techniques or through RT-PCR analysis. And in multiple studies, MRD has been shown to be the most significant factor for relapse. So we need to become better at assessing MRD for relapse. And why is this important? Because when you transplant a patient in their disease course is a very strong predictor for how, what their outcomes will be. So these are patients that, were that received a sibling donor transplant who were older than 20. And if they were transplanted early in their disease course, meaning in their first remission, their outcomes at, were better than patients who were transplanted in second remission or third remission or beyond. And this holds true across the board. So this is for sibling donors. And the curve is very similar for patients that receive bone marrow um, as well. And so it holds true for peripheral blood stem cells for bone marrow that if you transplant patients with advanced disease, your outcomes are abysmal less than 20%. And so when you're thinking about transplantation, this is one of the reasons why patients need to be referred very early for transplantation. And this is definitely kind of a national push among transplanters to refer patients, all patients in first remission, patients who have primary induction failure or relapse, anybody who has any evidence of minimal residual disease, and patients who are in CR2 and beyond. HLA typing is very important to send at diagnosis because if we think patients need to be transplanted, searching for a donor can take several months. 
And when you're ready to transplant that patient, you may not have any options. And so now, switching gears, as we race into the future, um, there we'll focus on novel approaches in refractory B-cell ALL. So for the upfront population, we consider transplantation if they have high-risk features. But what do you do once patients relapse? And so typically, we give standard chemotherapy, different chemotherapy that patients may not have received before. But more recently, we have two novel therapies that have, are becoming available for patients with refractory B-cell ALL. I th and this really focuses on immunotherapy, and I particularly thought that how to train your T cell was particularly clever. Um, and two, um, and there's no lack of references to race car driving in all of the commentary articles with car T cells. Racing to the future, it's, it's pretty funny. Um, so two therapies that we'll focus on, one is called blinatumumab, which was approved, had a was approved by the FDA last year, and CAR T cells, which are investigational. Blinatumumab is a first in class. It's a, it's a bispecific T cell engager. It's a monoclonal antibody that is specific for both CD19 and CD3. So ALL cells are uniformly express CD19 on their surface. And this is a monoclonal antibody that binds both to the CD19 receptor on the surface of the B cell, as well as to the CD3 receptor on the T cell, causing um, activation, cytokine release activation of the T cell and destruction of the tumor cell. This study, this has been conditionally approved by the FDA that medication is given as an IV infusion over five weeks and in immediately um, depletes tumor cells and also causes B cell, um, B cell depletion of healthy B cells as well. And this is one option that we will get back to. But really, the focus is on CAR T cells. Um, and why CAR T cell therapy? CAR T cell, these are chimeric antigen receptors. There have been very poor outcomes in relapse refractory B cell ALL, and we clearly have the need for novel therapies. CAR T cells, they reprogram a patient's own immune system. These are selective therapies that are made for each individual patient, utilizing genetically modified T cells to recognize malignant cells. T cells are self-replicating and can persist for 50 years. Um, and T cells, we have a history of knowing that T cells can be safely engineered from the HIV experience. And so I don't know if any of you recall when this was published in the New York Times a few years ago. This young girl, Emma, was one of the, fir was the first child who received CAR T cells for relapsed refractory um, B cell ALL at UPenn um, and had a complete response and this was published seven months after the fact, and she was healthy. Um, and this, subsequently, this initial study has been published. Um, and we have a number of papers which have been published looking at the use of the application of CAR T cells in acute lymphoid leukemia, in chronic lymphoid leukemia, and also now in multiple myeloma. So the concepts of harnessing the immune system for immunotherapy are rapidly exploding. And CAR T cells um, are now developed in generations based on the complexity of the, the endodomain. So each of the CAR T cells has an, has an exodomain, a hinge region, a transmembrane region, and an endodomain, which has the immune um, stimulatory domains, which then are able to downstream regulate through signaling. And so this, com this has become increasingly complex, and currently second and third generation CAR T cell constructs are being studied in clinical trials. And the early experience with CAR T cells has been primarily at UPenn. UPenn was able to partner with Novartis to develop a platform for CAR T cell development. There has been experience at Memorial Sloan Kettering and at the NCI. And now another company, Kite Pharma, is, take, is utilizing the Kite C19 
construct, which was developed at the NCI and is currently studying the application of these CAR T cells in patients that have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and that study is actually currently open at Montefiore. But this will be the basis for the study that we are opening here at Mount Sinai. And so CAR T cells, patients, so how, what are these and how are they made? So patients who have, who are, um, who have disease are, undergo leukophoresis in the apheresis and the product of the mononuclear cells is then shipped to the processing facility. The T cells are then enriched and undergo um, cult processing and culture and interleukin-2, an anti-CD3 antibody. And then as a result, the T cells are activated. After several days, the T cells are ready to be infected and they're transduced with the retroviral vector that already contains the CAR gene in it. And so the retroviral vector is then, is then incorporated with the virus into, with the gene into the T cell. The product is further expanded in interleukin-2, and now this product is now known as Kite C19 and is made individually for each patient and then is shipped back for infusion. And so, just to see in cartoon form, here is the CAR vector construct, and the viral vector incorporates the CAR viral construct, incorporates it into the T cell, and then the CAR engineered T cell then expresses the CAR with the, the, with the endo, the endo portion with the co-stimulatory domain and the activating domain. And once this is in a patient, you have binding of the CD19, binding of the CAR T cell to the CD19 receptor on the B cells of the ALL cells, leading to cytolytic activity, cytokine release and proliferation, and your the goal effect. And so here we're about to open a phase one, two multicenter study evaluating the safety and efficacy of kite in adult subjects with relapsed refractory B cell ALL. And this study will be a phase one, two study, which initially in phase one will incorporate patients with high burden of disease. And then in phase two, patients will have high and non-high burden of disease. In phase one, there will be a dose limiting um, finding of the dose of the CAR T cells. And if all of the criteria are passed, then the study will proceed to phase two. The objective of phase one is a phase one study, so safety, and in phase two will be efficacy of the CAR T cell product. The study will incorporate when, once patients are screened and enrolled, and these patients need to have relapsed or refractory disease, they will undergo leukophoresis. After they undergo leukophoresis, patients will undergo chemotherapy to really keep their disease under control, essentially for the two weeks while, um, while the stem cell product is sent to um, to the processing facility while the, the T cells are prepared and the Kite C19 product is prepared. And so patients will receive bridging chemotherapy. Then they will receive conditioning chemotherapy. And the purpose of the conditioning chemotherapy is not only cytoreductive, but also to lymphodeplete the patients. We want the patients to not have their lymphocytes. We want to give them back the T cells because that's the fraction of T cells that we need to expand to provide anti-leukemic effect. So once the patients receive the conditioning chemotherapy, they need to be admitted for the infusion. And they will receive the infusion in the hospital and then will need to remain hospitalized for a minimum of seven days after the infusion or until any adverse events are a grade one or less. And then there is long-term follow-up. And actually, because this is a gene-related study, the FDA mandates 15-year follow-up. And so in terms of the primary study endpoints of safety for phase one and efficacy for phase two, there are a number of interesting correlative studies looking at the function of CAR T cells 
the persistence of CD19 cells, and also serum and CSF cytokine levels. So who will be eligible to participate? Patients who have relapsed or refractory B cell ALL. This can be patients who have been transplanted. If they were transplanted a minimum of six weeks prior for an auto or 12 weeks prior for an allo. And patients who have Philadelphia positive disease if they are intolerant to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Patients who received prior CD19 directed therapy, so either the bite therapy with blinatumumab or CAR T cell products will not be eligible. And also patients who have any active CNS disease or history of CNS disease because this, medicate, this, this product has a significant CNS toxicity. And anybody who requires treatment for active graft versus host disease because you would not want to infuse a patient with T cells to treat them. And so the adverse events that have been seen in the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma study using the same Kite C19 product are primarily seen in the first two weeks of infusion. And the most significant side, the most, the most significant adverse event, which you will see on the floor and in the MICU, um, is cytokine-mediated storm. And here we see patients with fever, febrile neutropenia, hypotension, vascular leak, renal failure, and hypoxia. Um, cytopenias are also common, probably more so related to the chemotherapy that patients receive prior to the infusion. Febrile neutropenia and neurotoxicity, which is also seen very commonly in the first week and, com and, and reversible. Dysphagia and aphasia. Cytokine release, um, so prior to that, so in terms of outcomes, looking at the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma study, two patients died within 30 days of infusion. And in terms of response rates, um, patients, the overall response rate was 83%, which is very high. And it actually is concordant with the ALL studies that have been done at Memorial and at UPenn and at NCI for patients with ALL in particular. Cytokine release syndrome is, is related to synchronous T cell activation. In prior studies, it was seen in some studies in all patients to varying degrees. And patients, re patients required a scary percentage of vasopressor or ventilatory support to the order of 20 to 50 percent. But this is reversible. And the severity of the cytokine release is associated with greater interferon gamma and notably interleukin-6. So patients with higher interleukin-6, higher risk of severe cytokine release, and also patients with higher tumor burden prior to infusion also had a very high risk of severe cytokine release. And also that's, that's also adding to the rationale of treating patients and cytoreducing patients prior to infusion. And so again, fever, hypotension, tachycardia, respiratory distress, vascular leak, and acute renal insufficiency. In more recent studies, patients are in current ongoing study at Penn, um, patients are being monitored for their interleukin-6 levels, and patients are being preemptively treated for cytokine release syndrome. And the treatment that is active is a monoclonal antibody used for rheumatoid arthritis, um, tocalizumab, an anti-IL-6 monoclonal antibody. This is used for moderate to severe cytokine release syndrome. This is highly effective. High-dose steroids, this will need to be, we will need to really think about this, but high-dose steroids are highly discouraged to use for cytokine release. I know that for many of us, the knee-jerk reaction is to give steroids. But if we give steroids to these patients, we will kill the T cells. So T cell, so steroids are really reserved only for very severe situations. And the goal is to avoid steroids for the first three months after infusion so that we can get that T cell effect from patients. And we don't need to, um, we don't, 
we want to get the best success for the patients. And neurologic toxicity, it's not really clear why patients develop neurologic toxicity because there, in studies in anatomic specimens, there are no CD19 receptors in non-lymphoid tissue. So there are no, CN no CD19 receptors that these cells can bind to. Um, but patients, it is thought potentially that CNS toxicity may be related to occult CNS disease that patients may harbor. But patients can present with hallucinations, delirium, aphasia, confusion, and this has been reported across the board in all of the CAR T cell studies, is seen in the first week and is reversible. This is also very seen in blinatumumab, and now as a result, blinatumumab has a black box warning both for cytokine release and for, and for um, neurologic toxicity because both are thought to work in the same, in the same mechanism. And <coughs> what is different about CAR T cells as opposed to blinatumumab is that with CAR T cells, you have a prolonged post-treatment lymphopenia where patients require IVIG and may have long-term infections. And also, we avoid the administration of any live virus vaccines to patients who are treated with, um, with blinatumumab or would be treated on protocol with CAR T cells. And so the clinical trial landscape for CAR T cells is growing rapidly. What was first just thought, just developed as CD19 therapy in ALL, CLL, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is now rapidly expanding to the myeloid malignancies, multiple myeloma, and also to solid tumors as well, including sarcoma, osteosarcoma, neuroblastoma, glioblastoma, breast cancer, lung, GI. So the entire spectrum is growing in terms of immunotherapy. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the future with this very targeted therapy that still has, still is in really in the very early phases of investigation that will be studied in the future. But currently, when you look on clinicaltrials.gov, you get 92 hits for chimeric antigen receptor studies. So this is a source of active investigation, but is extremely expensive and labor intensive because at this point, for each patient that we will enroll on this study, we will need to get a slot for manufacturing of the T-cell product. And if we have a patient who is eligible, but we don't have a slot, we will, we will not be able to treat that patient. So I think in time, right now, it's a highly personalized therapy, which has had excellent responses. In the ALL papers that have been published, the CR rate has exceeded 80 to 90% with sustained proof that the T cell product remains. The difference between the CAR T cells and blinatumumab is as soon as you stop the blinatumumab infusion, you see a drop off in activity. And also lymphopenia is quickly reversed. But for, one, for once, the, the, the prices are exorbitant for both. But certainly this, the CAR T cells may really offer a therapy that will change the landscape for patients with relapsed refractory disease. So in conclusion, ALL is a very heterogeneous disease. The outcomes vary based on age and cytogenetic risk. The optimal treatment requires a risk-adapted strategy. Patients with high risk should be considered for allogeneic transplantation especially in first remission, and all patients should be considered in second remission and beyond. The landscape is rapidly changing with the additions of blinatumumab and chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And the key adverse effects that we will be implementing education on the inpatient services with the nursing staff and house staff will be really recognition of recognition and management of cytokine release syndrome and rapid MICU transfer, because we'll need to have this all really well thought out for in order to be able to be successful. But we will be successful. And if patients have toxicity, we can treat them with tocilizumab, and neurotoxicity is also reversible.
So thank you. First, congratulations on, on devoting your work to such a uh, difficult illness, having such a horrible impact on families when youngsters get this disease. One of your slides um, showed that uh, Down's syndrome patients have more ALL. Mm -hmm. right? In children. <laughs> yeah, so mm -hmm. do you or your colleagues uh, uh, this is a question about causation, not about treatment. Mm -hmm. Do you or your colleagues uh, study the uh, peculiarity of uh, neighboring chromosomes 21 and 22 being linked? I mean, clinically they're mm -hmm. linked, but anatomically they're linked. I mean, are we studying that? I'm personally not studying that, <laughs> but um, that certainly would be something to really think, to really speak to our pediatric colleagues about. But that's a very interesting point. Yeah. Um, one of the things we've seen in our rheumatoid patients with tocilizumab is actually increased risk of GI perforations. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, are you screening your patients for diverticular disease and diverticulitis before you give that? And that, that's a real significant concern that we don't see in the control groups. So that's, that's not in, um, within the study protocol at all, actually, in terms of pre-screen, in terms of any GI. There are no GI inclusion or exclusion criteria. That's a very interesting point, though. Watch out. <laughs> I'll watch. I'll watch. <laughs> um, clearly, the neurotoxicity of the CAR T is an important facet of the treatment or side effect of the uh, treatment. You showed a slide showing all the different diseases that uh, CAR T is now going to be applied mm -hmm. to, including glioblastomas. Mm -hmm. So, is it known in the normal neuron what uh, is being attacked by the CAR T cell? What kind of studies have been done to determine that? Yeah, from all the reading that I've done about the neurotoxicity, it seems really unclear as to the etiology of the neurotoxicity and the data is much more mature for ALL, um, CLL, and non-Hodgkin's using the, 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 the CAR-19 product than it is for any of the other solid malignancies at this point. So I haven't seen any specific information for patients with glioblastoma because that will be using a different, a different construct for a different antigen. If you have a patient who's hypotensive, and if you think that this might be bradykinin related, usually in carcinoid we give solucortex. So you emphasize not giving steroids. Mm -hmm. How would you treat this hypotensive patient? Pressors. <coughs> the the emphasis is on the emphasis is on um, fluid resuscitation, but not significant. Not you know, not what, we, not what we give to septic patients, limited fluid resuscitation and rapid pressors. And then in severe cases, the tocilizumab. But the emphasis absolutely is on early pressors, um, in early initiation of pressors, because patient, giving flu, patients fluid who are already um, with significant capillary leak will not be of benefit. And the steroids will, uh, will kill the product will kill the treatments. It'll be a bit of a paradigm shift for us. <laughs> so you don't think the pressors, adrenergic pressors, are increasing the release of the substances causing the hypotension? They may, but, um, but in that case, we would then give the anti-IL-6 therapy. Because, and then we can monitor IL-6 levels, and especially um, and to really just suppress the IL-6, which seems to be the cytokine that has re is really driving much of the cytokine release syndrome. One more question. So uh, going back to the earlier part, uh, not the uh, end of your uh, discussion, in childhood ALL, the 
big questions these days are mostly related to the long-term effects mm -hmm. of the chemotherapy. <laughs> but as you point out, there now are long-term benefits from bone marrow transplant and other things that are being done. Is there uh, information about long-term deleterious effects on the adult patients with ALL? In terms of late effects? In terms of late effects. In general, there are. There is, a, there is a breadth of late effects literature through retrospective studies through CIBMTR. Um, in general, in terms of the si long-term side effects of chemotherapy that, are, that can be translated to many different types of patients who receive um, chemotherapy. But in terms of transplantation, I think those late effects are not dissimilar from late effects that we transplant patients for AML and other diseases. So there is, a, there is a wealth of information on late effects for adults. Let's thank Dr. Rodolfo.